Okay. Awkward 10 seconds you were talking about. There we are. It would appear that we are live. Um, welcome one and all. This is the first conversation um, that I'll be having with other people on YouTube. And um, Morgoth's review was probably the person I wanted most on. So I'm really grateful that he's chosen to come on. Uh, just a reminder that if you want to support um, either Morgoth or myself, the links are in the description. Uh, I'm not monetized, as you probably gathered. So um, yeah, Patreon is, is how that's going on for now. Uh, and subscribe and share and all the rest of it. Um, so, Morgoth, thanks very much for coming on the, the channel today. Um, I first heard of you a couple of years ago, I think it must have been, when I first started to realize that I wasn't the sort of classical liberal that I thought I was. Um, you get into this culture war stuff and, you know, it's easy to take a side in the beginning um, sort of trigonometry stuff, you know, you for or against work, all this and the other. But as I started to go down the proverbial rabbit hole, I realized it was a little bit more profound than that. And I came across your channel as I was going down that rabbit hole. And a lot of the things that you were saying about England and identity and uh, elites and the countryside and history and, and all the rest of the things that you cover really struck a chord. So I've been following you for some time. But I just wondered, you know, if if anyone's watching who hasn't heard of you, would you like to sort of introduce yourself? I, I'm particularly interested in how you got into doing what you're doing, because I, I listened to some of your videos and the impression I get is that you were sort of a manual laborer and you had various jobs in, in that way. And you, you got into this almost by accident. Yeah, I am. Um, originally, I was there was a little the the sort of the 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 law on how I ended up here, um, usually begins with uh, there was a little brief moment of time and around about 2012 when the Daily Telegraph, the the blog section had comments open and you could get away with blue murder uh, in the comments, um, and it was then it became a sort of hive of of kind of nas British nationalists and reactionary types and. Um, Eventually, usually it was kind of pawning the most liberal uh, of of the, the right as above the line, and and there there would be all kinds of arguments coming in and the you know, debates, and, the, and it was like a lively, fun time. And then eventually, the the barn hammer started coming in, and um, one of the writers kept saying like, "What you could always go off and set up your own blog." Um, which is what I did. Eventually, I thought he's actually right. Um, and then I, I set up the, the the reason how it would come to be Morgoth's review was because Morgoth was what I did was because I got banned a lot. Um, <clears throat> I used to cycle through like sort of Tolkien esque names. Some of them I just made up, and it just so happened to be that the one I was using on Discus at the time that I opened the the me first blog was uh, Morgoth, so it became, it became Morgoth's review. At that time as well, it was in terms of like sort of um, nationalist kind of a little bit edgy, a little bit close to the line kind of content, there was really almost nothing um, in, in the British scene. But I didn't, there was, the, there was some blogs that you would have like Sarah made of Albion and things, um, which, which would dwell on grooming gangs and did uh, they had a nice line in government sort of corruption and stuff but I, I wanted to I wanted it to um not be something which was easily identifiable as that as as a kind of say far right quote unquote or whatever other name they would call it and I, I always liked the idea of having um, something which was more culturally orientated, more with a sort of nerd uh, aesthetic and feel. But what I would actually be writing about would be um, also uh, touching on pop culture, but it allowed me a large kind of space to move around in, uh, to, to say whatever I wanted about this or that, the other. Um, so that's that's kind of how that started with the, the Morgoth's Review blog. And then it was difficult because I was working so much. So I ended up doing a couple of basic YouTube videos where I would just rant for like six minutes because it, it, it was I was finding it difficult to find all the time to write. And then so that's like the YouTube stuff uh, kind of came along as well. 
You're a particularly good ranter, though. That's the thing. I've I've uh, started doing a couple of ranty type videos, or I'm just speaking ad lib, um, partly because I could see how successful it was for you, and I and and fortunately, I've I've got half decent feedback so far. I think someone replied that I I sounded coherent. That's the very last thing I thought I sounded when I was doing it. But I, you, you, I, I can say in all honesty, uh, you were pretty good at that. Um, but thanks for filling me in on that. I'd always wondered about the Morgoth because obviously Morgoth is, I mean, he's more evil than Sauron in in Middle Earth. Yeah. So I, I thought, are you living up to that image, right? Because that's how that's how they box you in, isn't it? That if 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 they get a whiff of an opportunity to box you in as far right or as nationalist or whatever. They will use that label against you and bring the full weight of cultural force, cancel culture, the law down upon you. So it's interesting that your sort of pop culture is a, is an in for that. I, I'm thinking of your sort of, I say recent, semi-recent, because I only just saw it, your review of Dune. And I watched it mm. sort of last week and it was, you you know, you said it was basically, uh, you know, for reactionaries, it, it was... It was the complete opposite of Star Trek in a way, isn't it? Because Star Trek is this super progressive, enlightened future, which it looks really lush and desirable when you're watching it. But if you think about it to people like you and me, it's a pretty boring future. Certainly it would be for me. But watching Dune, you know, you've got, you you basically got everything but kings and queens. Well, you do have kings. You got lords and... Emperors and, and dukes and barons and... Um, blood ties. Yes. And, and, yeah. and, and, and they've they've... It, it's kind of like because it, it touches on the the circular view of history very well, June, which I find fascinating, because they, they, in June they are looking back on the Star Trek era. They, the, the Star Trek era is about uh, ten thousand years or more, twelve thousand years before um, June actually happens, and and what happens is in June it gets even more a sort of medieval because it's all about the birth of a new religion, which, which is called a jihad, which they sweep away the end. So, so like it ends with, uh, it literally says billions of people dying and uh, a, like a, a galaxy spanning like theocracy. <laughs> like that's, that's the progressive future of June. It's, uh, and so all of the Star Trek style stuff is, is, um, is in the distant past, which which is which is uh, to look into the future and see that well the the kind of the the United Nations uh, galaxy type thing, which is what happens in Star Trek, is actually just a it's just a phase that you're going to go through. I mean, funny enough, the exact same thing happens in Warhammer. And I think it's because Warhammer has kind of took some inspiration from June. But I was watching a new video uh, yesterday that somebody posted of the the law. Just uh, YouTube just suggested it, and it was a similar thing as again where the the age of like human flourishing and of technology like that's it's just a brief stage that you go through. And the norm is war and barbarism and religious fanaticism. This isn't something that will be vanquished. It's something you'll you'll get like a brief uh, period. And and I, I like that and I find that interesting because it, it's it's like the antithesis to a, a to a liberal worldview where things are just going to get better for forever. And and in in the case of um, like in in our real world and in, in the way things are going now it it seems obvious to me that like even if they could do what they wanted to do it leads to this like utilitarian sort of horrible pod life of of mass surveillance and just there's just this emptiness there's this hollowness to it which are a lot of people are are recognizing and a lot of people are starting to push back against I think so. Yeah, I, I see it everywhere. I think the writing's on the wall. Um, I mean, one one example would be the upcoming coronation. I mean, I've got my doubts about uh, King Charles's personal views. I mean, it's he, yeah, you know, he says some dicey things every now and then, but the very fact that he is king and we have a monarchy, and that it's still so manifestly popular across the country, for the most part. I mean, that's a massive up yours to the liberal mindset, to the Guardian, the, the sort of spreadsheet mindset. Uh, you see the uh, sort of Republic UK, I think they're called, 
um, shouting and hollering into the void, basically, because no one agrees with them. People, even if they can't explain why, they really like um, the idea of being ruled in one way or another by someone who is ruling by an accident of birth. And it kind of makes me optimistic, if maybe not for the near future, but certainly for the medium future. I used to be a lot more pessimistic about a lot of this stuff, but um, I don't think there's going to be that sort of thousand year interregnum of, of technological utopia that sort of Star Trek depicts and the World Economic Forum would probably like. Um, I think that the forces of reaction are, we, we have that on our side because it's perennial, right? It's not going away. It's not an aberration. It's just an expression of human nature. Yeah, I mean, I, I also think the, the, the what people will call the Great Reset or this new digital society they're creating, I think that in itself is a, a sort of backlash uh, against the idea that it didn't emerge. Like, it interests me how old all of the people who seem to push it are. They're, they're like, I, mean, I mean, I know like he's a bit of a John Bond villain, but it, it's Klaus Schwab's like 85 or something like that. You know, Bill Gates is pushing 70. And you, and, and, and it's like you think you think back on, say, when they were in their youth in the 70s, and it, they, there was a kind of promise of the future. There was a there was a promise of uh flying cars, there was a problem, there was a promise of clean streets. Um, and an end to sort of identitarianism or, or racism or tribalism or religion or all of these like unfortunate things. And you would always have like, like it, 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 back then, the idea that your fridge would monitor all of the food that you were putting in there and then calculate how much carbon was being reduced or how much, um, how much like fat was in your food for that week. And the, the fridge would have that all calculated. Once upon a time, that would have seemed amazing. Like people would have been impressed with that. And what I think is interesting is that if you look at the aesthetics as well from, from this era, um, the, you'll see that it, it lends itself to this new, clean, uh, technologically advanced future. And it didn't happen. And and there's there's so I often think when some of these powerful players um, look at the the world of the 2020s and they they realize they the, the future never happened and it, it's always a crisis for left meaning left wing people. It was a crisis when say the, the Soviet Union collapsed or there was a famous one where. I forgot who it was, but they saw the statue of Lenin being brought like, uh, like on its back on a barge going down the Danube. And it was this, all of a sudden it dawned on them that the, the, the future, which the, the promise of the future of Marxism was now over. It had never materialized and they were looking on it uh, in the past, in, in the past tense. And speaking about it and thinking about it as a thing that had come and gone rather than a, a thing which was coming to be. And I think there's a there's an element of various elites in the West that they're thinking like the future should not have been like this. The, sh the future should have been better. The technology should have been better. And, and now they're, tr they're trying to sort of desperately force it through. But the people have also changed. So now the idea in the 60s or the 70s of having a computer in your pocket, uh, which would track you wherever you went and give you all of this data about what you're buying and about your, your how environmentally friendly your habits are and your consumption habits are, that, that would have seemed relatively benign or something. Well, 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 who could complain about that? This is good. But there's a kind of weariness set in with this stuff now. And people begin to find it horrifying. People begin to find it horrifying that um, all of the money will be digital. And if you don't do what the, the algorithm tells you to do, then suddenly you, you're going to get docked. You're, or or some things, things will be closed to you. Which, I mean, there's another kind of aspect to this, which I, I've often got into as well, which, which is kind of like... The, the digital society seems to bring in as well like a, a gamified version of life where you're in the video game and you have to perform certain tasks to unlock the next thing. 
you know, like in the pandemic, it was just going to the shop. You had to wear a mask, and then it was later with the 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 needle craft it would open up possibilities for you. And then, so, so it's it's kind of like something intrinsic to to the digital the digital realm. It, it leans into a gamified gamifying everything for some reason. Um, and, and it seems to be transforming and, and, and emerging in the real world, which, which, well, I say emerging, it is being forced, it is being pushed by powerful players, you know? Yeah, I, I think a, a, at once a cause and an effect of that is the infantilization of society. Because um, I, I, before I, you mentioned barges as well, we could get into that in a bit if you want, because uh, I, I currently work on barges. Um but before that, I was a copywriter at a PR agency in London. Um, and I'd already moved out of London at that point for all the usual reasons. Um, but I, anyway, I was doing the PR. And, and obviously, I can't say too much because I don't want to get in any legal uh, battles with my former employer. But uh, basically, you know, a lot of our clients were... And it was kind of demeaning from the beginning, to be honest, because I, I already knew that people like, you know, David Cameron were from PR. So I already hated the PR industry, but it was a job at the time that I needed. So I took this and most of our clients were very much in this progressive space that you're talking about. So, you know, very much involved with ESG and the climate and, and green stuff and, and HR as well with diversity, equity and inclusion. I mean, uh, there's that saying from Solzhenitsyn about uh, live not by lies. And the whole time I was there, I just said, man, I'm living by lies. I, I got to leave eventually. But um, this air of desperation you were talking about, it very much comports with my experience of, of kind of working for these people and doing their PR for them. So everything is urgent. Everything's got to be done right now. Otherwise, we're, we're all going to die, basically. Uh, you, you see this in AI as well, because a lot of our clients were talking about AI and how they almost need it to work. They, they, they're not listening to people. And I'm not an expert in AI, so I can't. I can't say one way or the other, but I myself am extremely skeptical that artificial intelligence will ever actually be intelligent that the in the way that we want it to be, like human beings. I think, you know, even if it passes the uh, the cheering test, it, it won't be intelligent in the way that we want it to be. But they're so desperate because AI is like a sort of, it, it's a central pillar in their ongoing technological projects. So it has to work. And then you've got the fear mongering that comes with it. Oh, what if what if they uh, turn against us? What if they become super intelligent and and so on and so forth? And the sort of the Shire like Hobbit people standing in the background saying, "Well, actually, you know, a distinction you like to make more goth between um, incompetence and malice." I completely agree with you that malice is very much part of it, but it could also be it could also be incompetence, right? So th at the same time that they're sensing their own incompetence to bring about the world that they envisioned for themselves in the 60s and 70s, a lot of these older people, they become more and more desperate and therefore more and more malicious. And personally, I mean, I'm a Christian. Um, I, I wasn't always, but I see exactly the same thing playing out in the Church of England, like a lot of these so-called trendy vicars who are, you know, trying to make God a woman and, and change the definition of marriage and everything. These were people brought up in the 60s and 70s. And they're just not connecting with the fact that many of their younger congregants are a lot more conservative than they are. But, you know, you mention any of this and you get accused of being a conspiracy theorist or, or whatever. Yeah, I was I was I mean, a, a little sort of um, like hot take that I've got was. I was actually going to write like a quick review uh, for Substack when I got derailed yesterday. But I, what, the other night, you mentioned about the the sort of the malice and the incompetence or, or yeah. sort of being stuck in their own kind of echo chamber and things. And um, the other night I watched a, a, a film called the, the, the China Syndrome from 1979 with Jane Fonda, uh, Jack Lemmon, and um, an early role from Michael Douglas. <clears throat> And of course, the people who've been following my stuff uh, this year will notice like I've done quite a bit on Chernobyl, and it is that it is like oh, a sort yeah. of foreshadowing. Brilliant. Yeah, it is like a, a force. The China syndrome is kind of creepy and eerie. 
because it, it sort of foreshadows what would happen with uh, Chernobyl. And there was something else that happened with Amer an, an American island where they do nuclear tests. Well, if the name slipped away. I can't remember now. But at any rate, I, I, that's one thing, because there's this kind of format that I like of um, like high IQ white men being stuck in a horrible situation. And there's this because they've got a, an emergency. They've got something's gone wrong with the, the nuclear power station and it's all about the cover up. But what I like leaving aside the sort of the Chernobyl side of it, what I thought was interesting was that the main story is Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas are these journalists. Um, or, she works for a TV. She's a TV presenter, but they've got her doing like softball news and Michael Douglas is a bit more of a rogue. And then they they kind of um, set about investigating what went on at the nuclear power station because they think there's been a cover-up and they think the public safety was jeopardised. And it's all about this sort of, well, they're not allowed to go there because the corporation who has interests in the nuclear power, in the energy sector at least, also owns the TV channel, so they're getting pressure put on them from on high. But nevertheless, these these sort of plucky journalists, like they they don't listen to that, and they they, they go around interviewing people, and they're, they're they're sneaking around trying to get to the truth. Because because at the end of the day, it, it's this thing of like who, who, revealing the truth as a journalist with integrity. Integrity, you've got to reveal the truth. Uh, you've got to expose the powerful. This is a this is like a common thing in the seventies as well, you know. I mean, she even mentions Woodward and Bernstein, and I think in in the sixties, well, um, obviously you've got they're all boomers, and when you you get the sort of the youth, the teenage love era of the sixties, and then in the seventies you get this drab era of of like realist uh, dramas. They're usually quite intelligent as well. I was surprised, like how much attention had to pay to the script and what they were talking about. There wasn't much in in, in terms of spectacle, but it was well written. Um, and what I thought was interesting about it was like here you've got the boomers have entered the institutions. They've entered. The, they've now got careers, and they're. I think it's a sort of cope for them to to think. Well, we're still rebels. We're still out to do the right thing and hold the powerful to account, which I don't really think it was that much of a thing. But okay, I get it. But then I was thinking, like today, like the jour journalists are just regarded as the scum of the earth um, because they they don't do anything of the sort. Like even you you could say um, in the seventies at least when this was happening, Jane Fonda. Uh, there's, a, there's a touch of feminism there, and Michael Douglas is a bit of a rogue, and they, they they suspect skullduggery at the nuclear power station. And like now, you would expect the journalists to just be like doxing people and getting people fired from their jobs, and and not in any way questioning the 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 system. And it, it kind of it, it touches on on what you were saying before because. This has, uh, in a way, created a giant echo chamber for the elites, where even the pretense of them having any kind of controlled opposition has gone, because there hasn't. At least in the 1970s, if something, at least in fiction, um, <laughs> if, if something went wrong at a nuclear power station, and then it was discovered, like in the China Syndrome, that they'd... they'd they had ordered in pipes which weren't as strong as what they should have been because they, they were ordering the main on the cheap. Um, and, and they were never actually tested. So this is like the big reveal. But but now, and, and then, of course, the journalists are going to spread that. They're going to get it out there to tell everybody. But now you just expect the journalists to do the opposite, to cover it up. to to, and, and so what this has created is a situation where there's not really any checks or balances at all on what the powerful can do. or And, and it, it, it's really uh, unnerving when you look at some of the things that they've got lined up their sleeves, especially when, when they're going to just – if if you're out to save the world, that's going to burn up because of the sun. They can justify doing anything they want.
Exactly. Yeah, it's it's the ultimate crisis. I completely agree with you about journalists, and I wish I didn't because um, so I actually have a master's in journalism, which shouldn't exist, if I'm honest with you. You know, back in the day, you you walk into a newsroom without even a CV, you know, and you say, I want to be a journalist. And the guy says, all right, you can make tea for two years. And if you've got away with words or, you know, you show a bit of pluck, then maybe we'll put you on the beat somewhere. But um, so I, I finished my BA and I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do now? And the only thing I can do is write, really. Um, so anyway, I went and did this this master's that um, it, it just kind of egotistically calls itself the Oxbridge of Journalism. It's uh, the city, the University of London uh, near Angel. And uh, I went, I joined with a good friend of mine because we, we were both sort of our heroes at the time were, you know, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Hitchens, who we'd met before and interviewed uh, for the uh, university newspaper George Orwell you know all, all those sort of journalistic greats that you you would tend to idolize if you wanted to be a journalist and it was just the most revealing experience of my entire life and it left me with a a distaste for the whole profession um that that very much sounds like your distaste for it you know everyone there was left wing uh if you were to ask them you know who's your favorite journalist working right now in in Britain they'd probably say something like, oh, I don't know, Liz Hurley or something, you know, it is just the most depressing thing. And you you looked at these faces, some of them all right, you know, friendly enough, but they, they, they didn't have any love for the subject. It was just a career ladder for them. Like, I want to go and work for the BBC. I want to go and work for, for Sky. And maybe if I'm slightly less liberal than the other guy, I'll go and work for GB News. Uh, but they didn't have any respect for their, 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 I don't even want to call it profession, trade. Um, and you just know that not a single one of these people, what was it called the China syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. Not a single one of these people would have reported on that. Um, but you bet your bottom dollar that every single one of these people would have sided with the government or over, over the Lurgy, for instance, you know, it's really, it's really depressing. I was going to ask you actually, whether you'd ever considered getting into journalism because you, you've clearly got the the skill set but i'm just wondering who would hire you if they knew anything about you no i i, I wouldn't I, I just i just couldn't do that uh, at all i couldn't I, i'm anti-social anyway i just couldn't be around <laughs> and, and just the idea that um something happens somewhere like if i was to cover like what if i was to get sent down to like dover and cover them like the boat the, what do they call the small boats coming in I don't, boat, I don't see yeah. i don't make like, my views on that like I've got to, I've got to, I've got to wind it in for just Substack, but um, I, I, I know I, I don't, I just, I just couldn't bear anything like that. I prefer to just do my own thing. Um, I, I, I yeah, I just there's something. So I, I, I don't know what it is. There's something that I just, I find distasteful about even, even just the city of London. <laughs> like I, I'm too, I'm too antisocial. I'm too, too northern and too grumpy for any of that kind of thing. I think. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot in that, actually. Um, I mean, the small boats thing, I mean, I, I've lost, I wouldn't say I've lost friends over it, because I lost most of my left leaning slash liberal friends over the whole Brexit vote, because um, I, I voted to leave, and probably would again, although it's not like I've not been disappointed in what's happened since. But um, the the whole small boats thing, I mean, the number of people who basically told me that i'm fascistic for thinking what i think about that uh it, it's it's all it's all down to the overton window i mean you've written very eloquently of hanlon's razor recently i wasn't aware of hanlon's razor at all so that was really nice sort of device to learn about in, in terms of thinking about politics but for me the the main most useful device that i've come across in thinking about politics is is the overton window and how you know even saying something as banal as uh, maybe illegal immigrants shouldn't be given five star hotels. Uh, maybe you know men and women getting married and having kids is a is a good thing. Uh, you know, just basic stuff that your grandparents and their parents and their parents and so on have believed for like five hundred thousand years, and all of a sudden that's completely verboten. It, it's such a nakedly clear instance of how the the window has shifted to the left. Um, so that, that was the first thing. And just before you jump back in, you, you, you mentioned London. I mean, I lived there for eight years. Uh, have you ever lived there yourself? No, I've always avoided it like the plague. 
yeah well that that's that's wise you'd have to chop my leg off to get me living there again i mean i did i did i did live um on the continent in the in the the low countries for quite a long time but even then even then i i was out of the cities and i was in the uh, out, out in the out in the sticks I mean, one of the things again about I did a video. I think it was like last September or something about like Circo, um, and that the Tories have, have it was run by a Tory grandee, Winston Churchill's grandson. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And in I think it was like 2019, they'd been awarded a like multi-billion dollar contract, and the, the the idea was that they would find places for um, asylum seekers to live by waving lots of money in the faces of landlords, or if need be, hiring hotels or whatever. And what was strange was that um, in the in the year that they got the contract, the amount of people coming across the channel was very low. But what we've seen since then is is uh, the, the numbers go through the roof. But what I think is interesting, just to touch on the, the journalist side of that, is that if we actually had a functioning, like I, I've, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a bloke with a YouTube channel, but I could put the, I could put that together. Is if firstly um, that there's obvious corruption there because they're giving their friends these multi billion pound uh, contracts to house people. But then that also creates an incentive for the Tories, or they at least knew that the the all of that 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 contract would be needed, that those places would be needed in the years ahead. So then you think, well, well, okay, so this this is almost starting to sound like a conspiracy. But and and when it's a bloke on YouTube, it's easy to do that. And it's easy to say, well, you, you are you are like far right, or what is why are you so concerned about this? But if we had a functioning journalistic class who weren't just a bunch of whores, like they would be on that story. And it, it and it isn't so much whether they've got a left or a right bias, but about getting the truth to the people that that they, there's something not right here. That powerful people are up to no good, um, and that they're corrupt, and that they're helping their friends, and at the, to the detriment of the, the the people who are already here, of the native population, and and it, this is again like it, it, we we don't have it. Uh, what what you what you've got is like normal people with blogs or YouTube channels trying to trying to do this stuff, and and, and being demonized and um, all of the, all of this stuff as they do it. And, and all of this speaks to the, the, the this just the sheer level of containment the, 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 that the journalists have proven to be. They're, they're, they're less than useless because they will be the ones who are running hit pieces on somebody like me or some other fella who's looking into this stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do a, you do a Google search on someone like you and you'd think that you were basically Hitler. Um it doesn't matter to it doesn't matter how many times they break godwin's law it's like it it's never funny to them it's just funny to me you know it's like you can't be serious but the the whole what you've just described there that dynamic of you know corruption and vested interests and everything that that goes to the heart of of so many of the problems we face in this country like the housing crisis for instance um you know we need we we know that we need to build more houses even if we didn't have like mass immigration, we'd still need more houses. Um, at any rate, we need more right now because certainly people like me, I mean, I, I can't, I will not be able to afford to live in house for the foreseeable future uh, unless I win the lottery or something. Um, and one of the main things that's stopping that, it's like the government knows this. It knows it needs to build more houses. Everyone knows this, but they won't build them because who are the Tories' main base? Well, they're they're shyer people who you know rich, rich ruddy faced people. I'm, I'm not disparaging them or anything, but they don't want that. They're, they're nimbyists. You know, I've got I've got a strong nimbyist strain in me. I can sympathise with them. They don't necessarily want a massive development on their back door, but they won't have any new houses built, and they'll lose. The, the Tories know that they'll lose their vote, so they just don't build any for as long as they're in power. It's that simple. Um, and as you said earlier, I, I can't remember, it was, it was in a Twitter post, I think you said, so that, that on top of that, you've got the fact that there's literally not a single problem in the country that mass immigration doesn't exacerbate. 
So you've got this sort of compounding crisis where it just feeds, it's this vicious circle. It just feeds into each other and nothing gets done. And to go back to the journalism problem, I mean, this is why I love George Orwell. You know, I, I'm not in the least left wing. Um, and Orwell was till his dying breath. But Orwell had this incredible ability to not only, you know, I know it's a cliche, but speak truth to power or to vested interests, but also to upbraid himself when he saw through his own self-delusions. So I have no doubt that if Orwell were alive today, I think he probably would have voted Brexit. Not, you know, you can't know for sure, but he damn well would have drawn attention to the mass immigration crisis, among other problems. And he wouldn't have been afraid of using the, the term native born population, which he used a moment ago. I mean, even saying that now is, is enough to get you cancelled in some in some circles. But it, it's super depressing as well, because, um, you know, GB News and I can't remember, is it Tom, Tom Harwood? People yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, GB News, when that first came out, I thought, oh, goody, you know, finally a, a, a mainstream channel that's going to voice my concerns and, and your concerns and so on. And even they're constrained. You, you saw the, um, oh, what's his name? The Canadian chap. Mark uh, Singh. Exactly. Yeah. Which was probably the most interesting person on there. And it, it just goes to show that if you step outside those carefully curated bounds, you will be cancelled. It, it, it's a complete illusion. So again, it's left to people like you and, and to me, to some extent, um, I've not been in the game as long as you doing this, but it's left for people like us to say, well, hang on a minute, you know. Especially with the, the case of Mark Stein, because I just found it so obvious. It was the funny, because I, I did a um, I did a, 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 a article at Substack about it, and it just happened to coincide with, um, I'd, I'd finished reading Bertrand de Juvenel's On Power, and his whole kind of thesis is that he speaks of power um, as as a, like an, an, an amorphous force, uh, or, or with like which, which sort of shoves its tentacles into everything, and it always looks to expand itself and uh, re reproduce itself. And if there's an institution which is not under its control, it's got this sort of there's like an inevitability that it will try and as he describes it like a bear with a with a honeycomb where he it, it always has to crack it open to get the honeycomb and ofcom is is interesting because in theory um all it's part of the thing which tony blair brought, uh, brought in where the, the, i've discovered uh, the, there's even something called there's off offstead ofcom and there's even one for water called off what um, off what, off what, or something like that. But but off, it, off it, time. <laughs> yeah. And in in the case of GB News and Mark Stein, it was clearly political. It was clearly about power. It was it, it wasn't uh, because he was saying things about certain medical treatments, um, which which they didn't want on the news. They did they, they didn't want it on television. It was against the interests of power. It was undermining power, and so then another tentacle went in. Um, and are you in the the article that I wrote? I uh, used the picture from the Untouchables, where uh, Al Capone standing with a baseball bat, about to put, bash somebody's head in. Because that's that's what it was like. I mean, it was it was literally sort of that's a nice little TV stair station you've got going there. Be a shame if something happened to it. That's a like that's a nice little broadcasting license you've got there. Be a shame if somebody was to take it away, and they they got they, so they got rid of Stein as well. And so what that did was clear the way. Then they started stacking the presenters. They started stacking the place with Tories. Jacob Rees Mogg got uh, Stein's uh, slot, so it was made safe. It was made safe for power once more. It was a, it was like a little pebble that had to be cleared out of the way. Yeah, it's an expression of well, power, as you say, but it's it's gratuitous. It's like the it's like the bully in the playground who comes along and and twats you for no reason whatsoever. You know, they just they want to set an example to other people who might be tempted to say the same things. I I really like Mark Stein as well. I I, I didn't know too much about him before all that stuff came out, and I went and looked at some of his speeches he's given over the years to various societies and foundations and everything. He's absolutely brilliant. It's a real shame that they've uh, that they've lost him. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I um, going back on some of the, 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 the Morgoth law, I actually came across Mark Stein way back in when he was in his neocon days. Um, and there was a lot of it, a lot of the stuff was about Islam. I mean, his predictions yeah. on that and the demographics, that didn't happen, which is an interesting subject in itself because in the 2000s, it certainly looked like it did, it was going to happen. But um, I actually, I actually think the 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 kind of the liberalism held its line. I think the feminism and all of that it it kind of worked some kind of magic. Though it is it is strange how we just don't get terrorist attacks anymore when the West has never been more degenerate. But leaving leaving that aside, um, I remember I remember back in the day that he. When when I was just sort of becoming more politically minded, he was able to supply me with just a few talking points, um, clever clever talking points that I, I gave me something to push back against, which when I, and I always appreciate. That. And he, he is he is a likable fella. He is he is decent. Uh, I, I always have a soft spot for for Mark Stein. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually I was going to ask, um, what what is your political evolution? Um, you know, because you 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 present you present a very um, coherent. I'm not sure how you would label yourself now. I mean, labels can be constricting as as much as they can be helpful. Um, so I'd certainly be interested to know how you would identify if I'm pressed. Um, but how did you come to the the positions that you now hold? I would probably just uh, call myself a British nationalist. Um, nothing, nothing more fancy than that. I, I, like some people get bogged down into the minute details of, of yeah. ideology. I've I've never really done that because I don't want to be pinned down. And uh, it seems to me that if 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 the worst of all of this uh, was over with. And we had sensible people in charge again, and we could gradually begin to sort this mess out. I'd be quite happy to just like retire and to, or <laughs> or to, to like write about fishing or something like that, you know, and like leave leave others to flesh out the economics or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I, that that's I'm pretty much just I would just describe myself as a British nationalist, to be honest. But um, I, I do think that the my I have been influenced and sort of changed a little bit over the years. I mean, the, the big thing that happened in around about 2018 was when I discovered Oswald Spengler's uh, sort of worldview. Um, yeah. that, 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 that was like a seismic event. Uh, I'd read others. I'd read Nietzsche and I'd read some other philosophers of the, of the German stripe and other reactionary stuff here or there. But Spengler impacted me like a nuclear bomb because there were things he, – he was answering questions which had been in the back of my mind forever, uh, which I didn't even know they could be answered. Like, what, why, why, why is there a certain sort of aesthetic to, like, the romantic era of paintings in the 1900s? Like why why does it look that way? Why is that why is there so many browns and deep reds? Or why why is it that um so many churches in the Middle Ages across Northern Europe all look so similar, uh, even though they're, they're different different countries, often at war with each other. And it was all of this, all of these, so many of these questions. And uh, well, I mean, one of the one of the main ones. A main question in my mind was, why is it that we don't produce classical music anymore? What, what, like, what, what, what went wrong there? Why is there nothing comparable to Rembrandt being painted, or uh, nobody is producing a symphony which can be compared with something that Brahms or Beethoven did? Even even if it was like that, even if it was in a, say a modern electronic style, or even if there was a new form of art, but it was just as uh, sophisticated and brilliant and beautiful as what had gone before, even if it was in a different form, but it still expressed something. You know, it's it's it was still there as a new something new, but it had seemed to me that these things had ground to a halt. 
um, entirely, and, and you could trace back the decay. Uh, and this is this is uh, sort of exactly what what Spengler did, and I, I, that, that was like, okay, so so we're, we're looking at the civilization itself. Uh, it is like a living organism which goes through seasons. And then to, uh, all of these different things began to fall into place. I mean, in a way, he, he preempted postmodernism, as did some other figures from that time. But then from the right, we tend to view it as, as, a, as, a, as a left wing thing now. But there, there's also, a, I actually think that some of the, the, left, the left wing thing has copied uh, people people like Spengler who came along earlier, where they were questioned because it was a question of what happened after the Enlightenment, and and they begin to see things uh, breaking apart, um, and, and so that that was that was massive on me, and that, it was then that I began to switch away from, um, in terms of content, the sort of the like riffing on the dialectic of the news of the day. Um, and, and taking a step back and looking at things more in terms of the bigger picture, which is uh, probably still where I am now. And this is why I've had a few controversial takes over the like regarding um, the pandemic and regarding technology, because what I'm then trying to do is map onto that in a sort of civilizational uh, way. So, so the, the technology thing, I started earlier by saying the, the, the arc of history, the cycle of history. So you can see the, the kind of the utilitarian, sterile, technological thing where we are now is, is very late. It's, it's because it's, it's got no metaphysics to it. It's got no poetry to it. It's got no soul to it whatsoever. And so that, that whole way of thinking uh is is to me like just begging for catastrophe and you see it coming in where you you'll see little things that they're working on in white papers and policies departments and ngos like the one world project where it, the idea is that um it, it connects with the climate change thing but humanity will be decentered so after say world war 2 or humanism in general, you know, before that, the, the, there was this idea that, well, the world, world affairs uh, revolve around man, around humans, um, and we will give ourselves all of these rights so that we, and then we'll also, as a secondary, take care of the natural world or whatever. And, and when you look at some of the things that they're coming up with now, it's like, well, we, we have to decent our humanity and then we will have this in one large interconnected system and from that perspective of course um again everything can be justified so this is where you see things begin to pop up like 15 minute cities or tracking what you're going to eat because you're, you're no longer really a free person with agency you are part of a larger whole um, under these, whether or not they can actually manage to pull this off or what kind of pushback, you know, it isn't inevitable. We'll, we'll see how they go with it. But what I'm trying to say is that when you're at a certain stage of civilization, and particularly Faustian civilization, you will see these grand schemes, these, these kind of megalomaniac ideas to, to control everything around the whole world. Uh, as if it's like a, a machine, as if it's just a giant clockwork uh, watch or something like that. Yeah, and that's the Enlightenment influence coming in as well. I mean, uh, the the Enlightenment, I, I want to come back to Spengler in just a second. Um, I, I haven't read Spengler, by the way, so I defer to your greater knowledge. But the, the Enlightenment is the sort of... Um, it's the problematic... It, it's it's almost like the, the genesis event for modern progressive liberals uh, uh do you know stephen pinker yes um yeah i do yeah yeah so his book enlightenment now um if you read that it's it's the spreadsheet mind right in front of you in broad daylight it's you know he he, he everything before the 1700s was 
unending misery and unachievement and poverty and strife and blood and so on and everything after when we discover reason and science and everything it's it's just peachy um and that's that's the mindset that our sort of governing elites seem to have today um i'm not sure you say metaphysics like um i, I would agree with you that we lack a metaphysics at the moment i mean do, that that brings to my mind religion i I'm, I'm not sure if spengler was religious or not or, or if you are i mean you don't have to say but no, well, I, I, what, the what problem... metaphysics sorry go on well, well as in as in 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 spengler's terms that would be like a sort of an external force which was an impacting and molding and shaping the the civilization which you couldn't actually quantify yeah. and in 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 he has a different one for each uh civilization and ours is this yearning for infinite space um, and freedom? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and and freedom as well. Just this untethered sort of will to. Th this is where, if you see the Caspar David Friedrich picture, oh, where yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a man who looks like Nietzsche standing on a mountain. I was going to say Nietzsche. Eyes. Yes, so yeah, he was in Spengler was influenced by him heavily, um, but up until the point. There was there was a he recognized a paradox with Nietzsche because Nietzsche didn't understand that Nietzsche was a Faustian man, and so he tended to view things in these universal terms, according to Spengler. Um, but 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 so he he didn't actually understand where he was on the cycle, that he was himself part of this sort of he was he he belonged in the late civilizational phase say uh, just after just after the, the 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 grand expansion of everything which you see in the 19th 1900s um in the in the 1800s sorry the 19th century where you see european civilization at its absolute peak uh fully extended uh fully sort of ruling the world like gods um, and then, and then, of course, you get World War One, which, which is the that that's that's when it begins to fall apart. That's the death wound. That's the first of a, of, a, of, a, of the first kind of major death uh, bleed. This that that hit the, and that itself gave rise to people um, such as Spengler or uh, Ganon uh, or. or um, you know the the what what's the T T S Eliot as well? Oh yeah, I love T S Eliot and, and Tolkien. So after after World War One, you you tend to get this deep pessimism coming in throughout the twenties um, and and going on. These men who've been marked and scarred, and they're finding that there's something deeply deeply wrong. With the, with, with the state of Western civilization, you, it's reflected all the way through the Lord of the Rings, for example. You know, you don't. It isn't all about the like the so, people, obscure German philosophers. It, yeah. It's it's there. It's it's there in everything. Um, this I, this I mean, story. I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but you you said in um your your was it spring springtime update or or something on on your Substack. Um, you were interested in doing something about the wind in the willows, right? Because it's this, it depicts yeah. this, um, you know, albeit with animals, it depicts this very uh, Edenic Edwardian England that you and I could, um, you know, we can't help but be nostalgic for. Um, and then I see the First World War as this, it's like uh, if you've got that Garden of Eden, the First World War is is eating from the tree all over again. Um, uh, Peter Hitchens, as you probably know, puts puts pretty much the collapse of the West from its full extent, as you just said, to the the First World War because you it it encompasses everything, right? It's the you're, you're having the wall pulled over, uh, pulled from your eyes about the the true capabilities of technology because human beings um, apply technology to warfare first and foremost. There's this great line in uh, Blood Meridian, I think it is, by Cormac McCarthy. Where he says um, war was the ultimate practitioner awaiting the ultimate game awaiting its ultimate practitioner, and human beings are the ultimate practitioner. So we've got that um, th this dreadful realization of what we can do to one another on such a scale, and then you've also got 
the the collapse or the, the the first sort of salvo in the collapse of of our religion that we've had for two thousand years, uh, because you've got your Christian princes and Christian priests and so on egging this war on from the sidelines. It's it's this total disaster, um, and obviously Tolkien fought in that war. But then I, now I'm thinking of the scouring of the Shire and and Isengard and everything. Isengard being well London, I guess, but yeah. It's, the, the it's, parallels are incredible. It's 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 interesting with Wind in the Willows because that was set just before the war, and yeah. then when you and there's an element in um, Lord of the Rings of where Frodo wants to go back to the Shire. We all want to go back to the Shire, mm. but there's there's a message there which is that well Frodo can't because he's been marked, he's been changed by what he's been through with, with, yeah. uh, in, a, in a sort of symbolic, well, also a physical way, a psychological way. He, 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 it's no longer possible to go back to the Shire and live as he once were because things have fundamentally changed, metaphysically changed in the world. And so the, the, this, it's, it's like impossible to get back to the wind and the willows of the pre-war era. And I think this led to a sort of a, a, a deep melancholy across the whole civilization, which is why I would probably controversially put in the the mid-century Germans who came just a couple of decades later. Um, my, my view on that is that that was a long in the brewing um, sort of last ditch attempt at rejecting modernity, rejecting the trajectory of the modern of the, the West where the West was going. Um, uh, this kind of sort of desperate attempt to, to prevent the future that they could see uh, uh, unfolding before them, which was, in the end, doomed. I'm wondering, uh, you, you, you like Spengler, and I, I've, I'm inspired to read Spengler now. Have, have you come across Hilaire Belloc? Have you read anything by him? No, I haven't. I've heard the name, but I haven't, um, I haven't read him. He was good friends with G.K. Chesterton. Um, I think he was, was he born in France? I think he was born in England. He was half French anyway. Uh, not, that that, not that that counts against him. Um, but uh, he wrote, I can't remember what the name of the book was, but he wrote, um, he reminds me of Spengler because he, he wrote this book about Islam and the West. And uh, I've got the quote up here, actually, because I thought you might find it interesting. It's, it's just short. He said, uh, it has always seemed to me possible and even probable that there would be a resurrection of Islam and that our sons or our grandsons would see the renewal of that tremendous struggle between the Christian culture and what has been for more than a thousand years its greatest opponent. And I'm not sure where that fits in with Spengler, but you've it it just reminded me of it because you've it's sort of uh, dichotomous. You know, you've got I don't want to say good versus evil, but you've got these two great forces aligned against each other. Um, and as we go, well, we're firmly in modernity now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I would categorize good versus evil now in the in the Britain in which you and I live. I don't think our economic system helps in any of these things. You know, we're, we're talking about the, the this last ditch effort to stop the march of modernity, right? But the mar a march implies something unstoppable, um, and I think it's partly unstoppable. And this is going back to what you said earlier, or, or implied earlier. Um, how, you know, we're not having sort of very many Islamist terror attacks anymore of the scale of 7-7. Seven, seven. And that's partly because Islam in, in Britain, at least, it's it's succumbing to that uh, solvent of, of liberalism. Liberalism is just all powerful. Everything it touches, it turns into its own image. Um, yeah. yeah. If you look at the people coming in um, on Dover, you know, you get all of these grim photos um, and they're, they're getting off these boats and you see them hanging around on the streets and they're wearing skinny jeans and they've got iPhones and yeah. um, they're not they're not coming over in the traditional uh, garb. Uh, we, we, in a way, I would prefer it if they did. So and, and another thing is, like, people will say they're coming over for the money. They, there's like they probably are coming over for liberalism. And I say that as, as somebody who's deeply critical of, of liberalism because it's going to just hollow out everything. I mean, you, you see these, um, it's like everywhere in the world now is outside of the West is adopting a reactionary position 
in, in relation to the West itself. You see these concrete uh, policies being brought in by the Chinese to prevent certain sort of degenerate uh, things going in into China, ideas, you know, about sexuality and whatnot. Putin has spoke openly about how the West has completely lost its mind. It can't define what a woman or a man is anymore. And it's it's as if it's this like horrible, toxic brew coming out of the West, which everybody else in the world is is coming to grips with and trying to shield themselves with. So in the end, the, the, it isn't so much in in, in uh, Spengler's terms, it isn't so much that it's Christianity versus Islam. It's it's whether or not the because the the sort of the the madness of of the, the late West. Is um, it, it? It comes almost, almost all of it comes down to like the liberation of the self. So without constraints, as we touched on earlier, there will be no bounds, and you can see that in in in, in its earlier stages when you're talking about free speech, for example, that seems okay. That seems fair enough, but if if that's written in, if if that is the way you're going to go you will end up with uh, the, the the transsexual stuff, um, especially when it's encouraged by nefarious actors in various prominent positions. And so all of this is heading towards uh, the rest of the world and they don't like it. Or maybe they do. This is, this is kind of where we are now. Um, but I can't think of anything more depressing than that this, is, this wins. And in a, in a certain sense, that the, this is the, the sort of the threat is is like the Faustian spirit gone sour, be, and become something quite toxic. Because of course, it is a tragedy. Faust is a tragedy. Um, in the end, in uh, he does get dragged to hell. Yeah, I, I like the myth of Faust. It was one of the better things that we read in school. I, I we did um, well. I did GCSE poetry and. Um, I freaking hated poetry coming out of school, but I, I love it now. Um, and then a level literature and, you know, you read, you read Shakespeare and you're basically told to find the Marxist or the feminist interpretation in Othello. And you think, oh, all right, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure Shakespeare had some really developed views on Marxism, but Faust was one of the better things we read Christopher Marlowe's version. Um, but when you, when you say Faustian spirit, are you talking about, the desire to be to be as God, effectively. Well, yes, it's 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 to be um, it's to know no bounds. Yeah. Um, and and this this takes this manifests itself in lots of different ways. So an obvious one would be um, the old the mountain. I forgot who. I always get the name wrong. But the, there was somebody was asked why he would claim Mount Everest. And he replied to the journalist, that uh, was it Edmund Hillary, perhaps, or somebody else? I can't remember. But at any rate, he replied to the journalist because it's there. And what's what 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 that expresses is that here is this this giant this mountain this, this heading into the heading into the, the heavens there heading into the sky, and when like from a purely rational perspective there's just no reason whatsoever to claim the mountain there isn't in the same way <clears throat> well uh, it's a slightly different but the, the same spirit is what would drive men uh, to fight, to discover the northwest passage or across the outback of australia or across the great plains of america there was just no stopping it um it was just expansion in all directions I mean, if you ever have a look at a Gothic cathedral and you put it next to a, a, a space shuttle, they they look very similar. It's very eerie how a Gothic cathedral from the Middle Ages, seen from the front, looks almost identical to a a, a space shuttle. Of and and the reason for that is they're both doing the same thing. They're both defying gravity. They're both yearning to stretch upwards and leave into into infinity. And you'll see like what Spengler would say on on say um, World War One would be the, the the rifles. Where what you've done, what what were the the machine gun, for example, or any any uh, gun, it, what it does is collapse the space between the enemy. 
So, so there's no longer this kind of sword battle. What you're doing is firing something from 100 yards away um, and killing your enemy like that. You've removed the space. Space is conquered once again. But then it can also be um, more poetically, in you'll find it in um, Gregorian chant music within the cathedral, which is purely ethereal. This is why, I, um, I mean, some of the, the classic stuff of the 19th century can seem quite heavy duty and daunting to listen to now, but always the Gregorian chant, it, it hits something spiritual within us, I think. Um, be, and it's as if you're getting back to the purest form of um, musical expression in our civilization because it's, it's, just, pure, it's just the voice. It's just purely in, in the air. It's floating which is always the same thing again and again and again. I mean, just to contrast that, the, the um, he also gives a prime sort of symbol to the Islamic world as well. Um, I've got a whole video up on the channel where I go through, I think it's six or seven major civilizations, um, and have a look at what he had to say about them all. So eventually you are going to get into this rather strange place when you get into late civilization, the religion has gone, everything has, has been jettisoned, but there's something still there about that drive. And, and it will express itself in quite perverse ways, I think. Another example will be... Um, say cyberspace there's this there's this danger of people being drawn into the internet into into the infinite into the the metaverse you know the, these these infinite spaces which are now in in digital worlds is, is also something quite quite a, a problem you, we we talk about people staring all day into their phones or, or whatever and I think that it's it's all it's all related uh, to it. Just as an interesting aside, like the because I like I like the look for these things in various places. Um, and it was an older take of mine, but if you look at say the the the, the Chinese sort of symbol is the path that like a crooked path going hither and thither. So if you look at a Chinese painting or something, uh, you can see that it's a path that kind of meanders and turns back on itself. And in Spengler's view, this was typical of the Chinese mindset. It's sort of two steps forward, two steps back kind of thing throughout their history, which, which is which is accurate as well. But if, if you look at a game, like um, I remember when I used to play uh, Final Fantasy games, especially Final Fantasy VII and... It is like that. It is like this path that meanders but is enclosed in. You can't actually get off the path. It, it, you just sort of go on these meandering through. Through you'll Maybe you'll go in for a chest, but then you'll come back out and then you'll go. And it was a, a specific sort of design of, of the Japanese Oriental games was that you were locked onto this path and you couldn't get off. But then when you look at something like Skyrim, the whole point is that you just go wherever you want. And this this is the, the the contrast between the two. I mean, Skyrim in particular is this kind of hyper real representation of it, complete with like romantic era backgrounds and Wagnerian music and the choral music. So it, that's why I think it was so popular. But uh, yeah, I'm going all over the place here now. No, I like it. Like like the winding path. Now it's a fascinating contrast between Oriental culture. Uh, broadly speaking, and and Western culture. I mean, I'd always seen Western culture as, uh, and hence where progressivism comes from. You know, linear because I think that's the in Christian metaphysics at least that that is it's not circular, is it? It's not it's not cyclical like the Greeks. There is this escape, there is this salvation, and it and it's in Christ, and it it has an end when all 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 will be all, and all manner of things shall be well, and so on. Whereas in Oriental culture, you you simply don't have that. You've got the the wheel of Oh God, it's been ages since I've studied this stuff. Uh, you know, the wheel of Dharma or, or something, and and you're you're trapped in Maya. Uh, I was I was reading sort of a little book on Japanese aesthetics recently because uh, I'm quite interested in the the similarities, but also the differences between England and Japan. Um, I covered it in the first episode of my my weekly show, uh, State of Disunion. Yeah, where... I enjoyed the video. I watched it yesterday. 
Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you. Yeah. So you you've got this um these, these two different metaphysics, um. But but just because I don't want to run away from something you said before about this um closing the gap, right? So you you talked about bullets from guns and how they they close the gap more more quickly. They they eat up space time, if you will, um, as opposed to swords where you have to go and meet your enemy. So you're when you're using a sword, you're constrained by forces outside of you. Um much more so than you are with a gun because you can you know you can shoot someone half a mile away and i it made me think of um you you said how cathedrals look like spaceships uh or space shuttles and obviously when you've got a church or a cathedral the, the main feature is the spire and it it's soaring up into into the heavens and the whole point of that is that it's um it it's trying to close the gap between heaven and earth, right? It's trying to reach up mm -hmm. to God. And from what I could get, gather from what you were saying, I mean, this this was the sort of Western uh, disease, if you will, but also it's triumph. It, it, it's at once our, yeah. our it, it hobbles us, but it's also our greatest achievement. We're constantly reaching out to do things that we don't need to do, like Edmund Hillary climbing the mountain. Um, and yet we do them anyway, like, like Icarus, you know, flying to the sun. But what... My my perspective on that, there's this really interesting uh, psycho I think psychiatrist called Ian McGilchrist. He's a really interesting guy. He does stuff about the the left brain and the right brain. And he said, you know, imagine you've got this mountain, right? If you're the local tribe, you see that mountain as you know, full of gods, and it's 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 something that you reverent reverence. If you're a prospector from the west, you come along, all you see is you know a bank account. Now think of all the ore that you could mine and and how much you know you could stick a ski resort on the top. So I'm I'm wondering if you know I don't quite know where I'm going with this, but maybe the the problem is one of perspective. You know we 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 need to see things other than as resources to use, which seems to be the Western kind of linear thing. You know you you go you use it you dump it. It's all very utilitarian. But actually, if we just shift our perspective somewhat, maybe to a more oriental one, um, certainly Japanese at, at this point, it, it's something it's something that you're, you're not using, but you're appreciating it. It's holy. Look at Mount Fuji, right? I mean, I don't know if there are any ski resorts on Mount Fuji, but I know that it's considered sacred by the Japanese. The problem, the problem that, I mean, I, I actually think the biggest problem we have in the West um it is is this disenchanted world it is just everything's just purely materialistic and utilitarian mm. um and, and somebody uh some uh, like a pagan was I, I did a tweet yesterday and there was a pagan popped up uh because <laughs> that's, we, that's we, a line there a pagan popped up yeah and and you you, you get this well you know because it was in, it was in really it was easter obviously so there was some hot takes going around on that and i think same with st george every and, year and, and and but what i thought was interesting was like this this the, the problem is not this or that religion but no religion so it, we were in such a bad state now that um, I mean, you asked if I, I believe in God, and I always feel there's some kind of barrier. I feel like I am of like post modernity. Um, I, I, and there's a kind of it's as if I'm in some kind of dome, and there's there's a block on me finding any kind of genuine spiritualism. What I can do is enjoy things second hand, and I can enjoy. Which is why, which is what led to the back and forth that I had. Where I don't like to see um, the last fifteen hundred years of European civilization trashed. I just don't. But at the same time, I, I recognise where we are. There was an article that I did at the um, at Substack last summer when it was I called it the disenchantment of the Rhine, and the 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 like. The, at the time, because it was a heat wave and the rain, the river rain dropped to its lowest um, state forever because they had these stones where when, when the water was really drying up and it was becoming an emergency, um, hundreds of years ago, the last time it happened, people had chiseled into the stone. Oh, so, I remember this, yeah. So it would be like, I am hands. There was one of them said... And it was rivers around Europe as well. 
Um, and there was one of them, it would say something like, um, my name is Hans, when you see this, fear, because death is coming. And what he meant was that now the river is so low, you're going to, it, it could be a drought, which happens every so hundreds of years or so. Regardless of the reasons for why that's happening, what I, what I thought was uh, horrible was the way that it was being um, discussed in the newspapers, because they were saying like this is a problem for the German economy because the German economy um, has a lot of uh, chemicals, it transports cement and cars, and it uses barges on the Rhine to do that. And so this is the this is the danger being posed to the, to the like the if the Rhine dr keeps drying up like this, the German economy will be severely hit by it. And, and they showed these pictures of the rain, and it was just like a mud bank with like a shopping trolley and a, a car tires sticking through the mud. And I thought this is the most depressing thing ever because the river rain is the spiritual heart of Germany and arguably then so of Europe itself. And to reduce that, to reduce the reign of Wagner and of a thousand poems and sonnets and of uh, ancient battles with Romans and all of this, to reduce it to, to like a, a conduit on a network for, for the transportation of cement, I just thought was disgusting. I, ju I just thought this, this is the problem. Um, this, the, you know, we talk about our identities, we talk about everything being stripped out and laid bare and th this idea that you're going to reduce you know if if mount fuji in in um in, in japan is this sacred place uh for for the japanese people they that that's a wonderful and beautiful thing but the rain was once that for europeans or for and certainly for germans and and to see it being spoken about as just this thing which transports cement it encapsulates the entire problem that 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 what we face, and so what I would what what we need is to be able to re-enchant the world, to to be to have it more once again more than the sum of its parts. Um, it's not just a river; it's more than that. You know, it's not just a hill; it's more than that. And it, it reminds me of um, C.S. Lewis, where the abolition of man, where he talks about this. Where the, the the boy is in the uh, being taught in school, and the the teachers ask him to describe a waterfall, and he says, "Well, it, the waterfall is beautiful," and and they're pushing back and saying, "No, that's that's it just that that's your feelings about it. What actually is it?" And, and what they're looking for is, well, it is H two O falling over the side of rocks or something like this. They, they want to reduce it to just 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 this raw materialism. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read that for the first time, actually, um, a couple of months ago. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, another example that comes to mind is Roger Scruton and his book, The Soul of the World. But he, he talked about it all the time. You know, what, what you're talking about is the sort of, it, it's sacrilegious. That's what it is. But we don't have a grammar in our society anymore for talking about these experiences. I think most ordinary people would recognize the experience of sacrilegiousness. I mean, Orwell in the uh, Spanish Civil War, he described his horror, even though he wasn't himself religious, he described his horror at seeing churches, Roman Catholic churches, burnt to the ground. And it just didn't seem right to him because something meaningful was being effaced from the earth. And Scruton, uh, the way he would describe this, uh, you know, that, that, that life is more than the sum of its parts. Um, sorry, it's more than its parts. It is uh, the Mona Lisa, or any painting for that matter, any masterpiece, you know, it, it's easy to give an account of it by just saying, oh yeah, well, you know, you could, you could render it all on some computer program, or it's, it's this many pixels, or it's this many pigments of paint. But actually, when you go and stand before any good portrait, you're not just seeing pigments, you're seeing another subject staring out from that painting and kind of interrogating you as one subject to another. And I think that that is what we have lost in 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 our society. We're, we're, we've become so accustomed to the metaphysics of seeing everything as a resource or as just parts to be picked apart that we are when we're, we're no longer, as I say, we no longer have that rich ethical or imaginative or aesthetic grammar. 
and and when you do bring this stuff up and you do talk in this way and because it, it's not it's not as though the churches are talking in this way anymore it's certainly the church of england isn't even though they have the resources there to do it uh if you start talking in this way you're you're seen as sort of irreparably backward so it, it's tragic in a way because it's it's almost like you know dinosaurs dying out and and one of them sort of slowly melting into the the prime primordial swamp or whatever over here after the meteor and it's just too far enough away from the other dinosaur you know to to be heard and and that's that's the real the real tragedy of, of our situation but I, I completely agree with you it's it's an issue of, of re-enchanting the world i just don't know i mean it's common for talk show hosts and and you know people like the trigonometry hosts and, and all the rest of it to to say at the end of their their shows you know how do we do this then what what would you recommend i'm not sure anything could be recommended other than just living it out in your own life and trusting in in the cyclical view of of civilizations um yeah. and not even civilizations just to add to that as well um because spengler talks a lot about civilizations from what i can gather but i think there's a distinction between civilization and culture and the Vikings didn't have a civilization. I would, I would posit they had a culture, and there's a difference. You know, they didn't build any really lasting architecture, but they nevertheless had this really sophisticated culture. I remember reading once that their swords were even more sort of advanced in terms of metal. Is it metallurgy, metalwork, um, than Japanese katana? And we don't even have that. Yeah, and and. Uh... Well, in 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 the past, I mean, they would they, at least the, the 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 world of the Vikings was an enchanted one. It did have its own mythology. It did have its own gods, and it did everything made sense to them. So they, exactly. they was the the but the problem the the problem with this kind of utilitarian materialist mindset is that when you begin like pushing back on some of the problems of, of the day. Like it, 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 in a way, it becomes it, it. It's based on a sort of hyper rationality of things, but it ends up becoming unhinged. It ends up becoming. Mad. I mean, an example that I always like to bring up is Satan in Paradise Lost, where he 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 begins as a purely he rational. His decisions are rational, and again, you will see this breaking away, this rejection of authority, which is God, and his going, his going his own way because he's he's come to the conclusion that he doesn't need God to guide him because he can make it up as he goes along. Um, he, he and he's a very charismatic. This is why it was so controversial. He's very charismatic. He's very. Uh, he's always got the best one-liners, and and of course, as he as he goes on as the, the the story unfolds he becomes more and more unhinged more and more sort of degenerate and to, at the end where he's just this sort of giant worm in a lake of fire and his his the way he, he talks and lisps and things and so it's very clever what's happened there because he, it's it's he's rejected the the god and and it it isn't that he is just immediately this evil person he's a he's a man of the enlightenment he's a man using his own reason but slowly he he the, he distances himself more and more purely on using his own his own thought processes without having anything outside of himself and it it ends up in in this kind of like madness which isn't at the beginning it isn't really apparent it's only further down the line that you see the crisis which it brings about. One of them, one of the, the things that you'll see, for example, is in Canada where they are uh, legalizing and actually encouraging euthanasia in people. It's the, the the bar to euthanizing people is is just going all the way down. So that if you if you are um, if if you're made jobless and you're struggling, this leads you to be depressed. It may be that the doctor suggests that you just they they call it sunset care or something like that. They they've got all of these euphemisms, but it, it's basically soil and green. It, it it's like this this gentle way, and they can rationalise that to themselves. They can say this is this is this person is suffering. 
it's it's not right that this person should we, they can even frame it in human rights the, this person should have the right to end their suffering and, and so so all of a sudden what was initially supposed to be this positive thing gets flipped you you and and it's, there's this increasing sense that everything's falling apart and we're living in a madhouse an absolute madhouse where we don't really have any direction out of it. We don't really see how we got here. But it's all of these little incremental steps from, say, feminism to the transgender issue, which is like seems to be the only thing you ever hear about these days in, in the discourse. Which we're not again, not, none of it, none of it makes sense. It, it's about this purely kind of the well, um, if if I'm free then I should be free to express my identity and you will have to respect that otherwise it impringes on my liberty. So you've ended up this this place of just howl at the moon and sanity. Yeah. But if you go all the way back, it made sense. <laughs> it, it seemed reasonable to begin with, you know? It, it's an unfolding logic. I, I was going to say on the uh, euthanasia front that that is peak absurdity, isn't it? You know, it is your human right to end your ability to claim human rights by dying. Uh, you you just couldn't make it up. Um, I mean, I don't know where I'd you know because that that's that's the strange thing about you know I, I don't want to speak for you, but that's the strange thing about for me at least. You know, I, I consider myself even now to be a relatively liberal person in the sense that. I I am content in my day to day life to just let people live how they want to live, but that it, it's almost turned against you in a way. You you can't remain neutral about some of these things at all. Um, I'm not sure how I would have responded to a lot of these struggles or battles or or whatever or claims back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. You know, with gay rights and and slowly trans rights and everything. Uh, it's all very it's all very it's painted as very harmless in the beginning and I, i'm sure there are aspects of it that are harmless you know i don't think gay people should be stoned or anything i i, I once i went to a catholic university and i actually knew i, I knew someone who literally said that uh, gay people should be thrown in barrels and pushed off mountains and that's a sl slightly more extreme take but it's difficult to know what to do with the unfolding and unfolding logic of, of all of this because I, I would completely agree with you the the place that we're in now is it's seen, it, it, it's discernible in its contours way back when. Um, ab abortion is a prime example of this. You know, uh, how did they start by saying it? Uh, safe, legal, and rare. And from there, we've gone to, you know, right up to the point of birth. Thank you very much. And if you disagree with me, you're a bigot. And it, it's all part of the same continuum of people who said along the way, particularly with the euthanasia issue, actually, because it's, it's not just in Canada, it's um, Holland as well. It, Holland is is a just as bad as Canada in this respect. Uh, it, it's um, it's it's the same thing. You you you're accused of being uh, what's what's the the logical fallacy? Um, snowball. You know what? What if this snowball's out of control? Oh, it won't snowball out of control. Don't you worry about it. But it always does because it's part of the same unfolding liberal logic of complete freedom. And the problem is that freedom was never seen in this way before the Enlightenment. Freedom was seen by the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and the ancient Christians, basically all of classical civilization, all of medieval Europe. Freedom was the, the I, I don't know how to define it curtly in terms of a dictionary definition, but it, it didn't mean living without limits. It meant living up to your responsibilities and your duties and your role in society within the limits that had been sort of set for you. And freedom was the ability to perform that role well and to choose among equally desirable options. But now freedom is basically a, a, a trip to the supermarket, isn't it? You know, you've got 55 different varieties of shampoo. Well, actually, my freedom is to have 56 varieties of shampoo. And that, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, one of the things just to, to, is, is I do think it's become so toxic now and so ugly that um, it, the, other people around the world and many within the West who are just ignored marginalized or censored i mean at least half of the west is against this stuff anyway um but 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 they, you're right because we're so sort of 
intoxicated with liberalism, it's difficult to find a, a, a frame within that, which is to say, well, actually, I'm going to take away some of your rights. Actually, I'm going to abolish the uh, Equalities Act. I'm go we're going to get rid of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and we're going to bring in new laws that you're not going to like. And that's just tough, I'm afraid. And this th that kind of language is, is like totally anathema. It's totally against the grain. It, it almost, almost in a in a religious sense, but I think um, if if you go back, I mean, to the nineteen eighties, which I would generally see. It's another article I did last year. Talk America's toxic rebrand. That if I think of um, what came after the the gloomy era of the seventies and the, the the China syndrome, and I think of something like Rocky or Ghostbusters or Back to the Future, it all had this sort of positive uh, decency about it. Um, and that, I, if I was a, a mullah or something, I would be more concerned about that America than socially than what the America, which is what we have now. Because it, it, America has always exported itself and its own ideals as a sort of um, enticing social program where, where people can people can watch um, Terminator 2 and, and, and be really kind of, it just looks so great. Everything about America is so cool. Whereas, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, adjacent to the movie critic YouTube here who, who, who've made a lot of a lot of noise about how terrible the, the what, what amounts to cultural export, a, a sort of soft power of America now is rubbish, absolute trash in a way that it wasn't a few decades before. So I don't know how much longer this can go on from the perspective of power from the perspective of, of the West being able to exert itself when most of the people around the world thinks it's disgusting, half of people in the West think it's disgusting, and you've got this cadre of, of, of sort of, you know, libtards and journalists and uh, people in think tanks and, of course, the corporations and the money power are, are kind of the only people who seem to be locked into this for, well, various reasons, Uh ESG stuff and, and you know all of that. Yeah, especially with someone like Biden at the helm, I, I think it's a myth that we we're telling ourselves at the moment. I, I say ourselves. I mean, I I'm not American. I've never been to America, so I don't want to lump myself in with them. I, I think one of the problems, one of the things we need to get away from, in, in certainly in Britain, is talking as though we are Americans or as though we are an extension of America. Obviously, culturally, we are in some way. You know what what happens in America? What, what was the phrase when when America gets a um, when America sneezes, Britain gets a cold or, or something like yeah. that? But we we do need to, I think, stop talking like that if we're going to begin to regain some of our well our, our native traditions and, and habits of thought and customs. The whole BLM thing in particular. But uh, no, no, I agree with you. I'm not sure how much longer it can last. Uh, have you ever been to America just out out of curiosity? No, I never have. No. You you lived in the continent for a while, did you say? Belgium and Holland, yeah. Yeah, interesting. I, I spent some time in Australia, um, and Australia is a weird because my my mum's Australian, so I've got I've got an Aussie passport. Um, and Australia is a weird one because it's you know you you need a car to go anywhere. It's like it's more people go missing in Australia than any other country on the planet, apparently. Um, and you you sort of drive through it, and there's there's sod all there in the middle. Everyone lives on the edges. But it's this weird amalgamation of Englishness in the sense that they drink tea and they have the the the, the Queen on their banknotes or, or whatever, um, and Americanness because you've got these you know roadside motels and huge McDonald's and and uh, massive sort of super malls. Um, but Australia's it, it's going to be another one of those countries, along with particularly America and 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 Britain, that has this sudden moment of sickening realization that actually you we can't any longer project ourselves and our values abroad because i mean australia is is it, it's it's faring up better than canada but it's it's not faring up that well when you look at its response to the lurgy particularly in the state of victoria but yeah i mean the five eyes uh, 
countries in general seem to be the hardcore sort of nexus of of, of a lot of bad things which is happening in the world today. Um, I, I find it I find it almost impossible to be sort of patriotic about what because of the difference. It's important, especially with America, um, to distinguish between the people themselves and the government, and it's the cent the centers of centers of power. Um, in, in in the Five Eyes countries, or, or, and and the West more generally, are absolutely rancid. I think they are uniquely uh, disgusting in history. Yeah, absolutely, just just I, I, I just I just can't stand them. I can't stand their values. I can't stand the way they think. It's purely mercantile. The the like the, 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 the it's the barest sort of tiniest little fig leaf. Of demo democracy uh, or any kind of expression expressing the will of the people, it's 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 just insulting that nothing nothing really is what we anybody ever wants or anybody ever voted for. Um, and, but but because you're living in in theory, like the name of it is liberal democracy, so it gives people the illusion that they can actually change things, which they can't. And so it keeps us in this horrible situation because at the end of the day, a lot of these values, I know it's like we've, we've kind of discussed it in terms of being emergent from um, liberalism itself, but, but it's also true that they are being pushed from on high with people with nefarious agendas and uh, ideologies and, and and schemes of their own as well so so it, it and, and it's very difficult to, to find out i mean one of the big arguments sort of back and forth that you, you see now is people arguing whether it is just directly top down or it is this more wider emergent uh phenomenon but that's that's probably for a different time now Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's good to sort of begin wrapping up because I don't want to take up too much of your your time. But um, you mentioned uh, a few moments ago uh, patriotism, and I, I suppose I wanted to ask: you strike me as a very patriotic chap, and a lot of your videos give me this impression. And you know, you 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 strike me as someone who loves your your country and your 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 simultaneously ashamed and aghast at, at what's being done to it and and your sort of inability to to stop it and i i wanted to ask because i find myself in this in this same predicament all the time to the extent that you know i don't want to i don't want to come across hyperbolic or or you know, big girls blouse or anything but it, it really is quite upsetting um you know when one identifies as english through and through and you, you see all these things happening to the culture that you love while the, your enemies claim that you don't even have a culture to love, which makes it even worse, H how would you go about being patriotic nowadays when there seems so little to be patriotic about? Well, what I do is tend to go back to the localism, and I tend to pick up on little things um, which which are intrinsic to the English identity, which which don't really involve the sort of the, what I would regard as being hijacked and jingoistic what what I once called bulldog nationalism which, which um sparked a lot of sort of controversy and a lot of debates and arguments um which which I, I viewed as being kind of an an unfortunate post-war narrative that we found ourselves in um but well because you're, you're what it does is reaffirm liberalism so then what they did the let's say the elites are, are that well okay you celebrate your the victory of liberalism um over the the racists on the continent therefore you can no longer uh oppose having these other people come in because that's what you your grandfather and all the rest would fought against and it, it's kind of like this horrible kind of Chinese finger trap that we so so I really want to just get past all of that um and and celebrate and well I celebrate I don't I, that sounds horrible that's like the way the lefties speak you celebrate they celebrate everything you know exactly yeah but, but, but just just sort of affirm our what's left of the the scraps of our identity 
Um, I mean, a video that I did last year was about the jazz bands because because it was an area which hadn't been captured and territorialized and weaponized against us. Just just the simple sort of love of hearing the brass the brass bands and and this kind of thing, um, the 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 countryside and the, where I do videos where I'm just out walking, which which always um, sometimes I'll just have a hot take to give and I'll just pull out the phone when I'm walking along a, a, a bit of woodland or across the fields, and I, I'm always surprised at how how much people enjoy those ones because. To me, um, where many of the videos that I've made or essays that I've written, like it's took hours and hours and hours of, of writing and thinking it through and or editing and putting all these different images together and getting the sound right. And then I can like pop out the phone and give a quick take in the woods and, and or when I with the fishing videos with the, which I did for a while. And they always got loads of hits, and I was I always regarded them as being kind of easy content. Uh, but everybody everybody got on board with them, and I think it, it, it's because there is like this simplicity. There is this like I literally am just sitting on the side of the Northumberland coastline with a fishing rod, um, doing nothing productive whatsoever. Which I think is a great revolt against the modern world begins with doing nothing uh, in terms of productive value for for the wider society for the corporation it, be, be, because every everything's been um calculated and it's going to be much more so in the future uh everything is reduced to man hours of, and income value and and you know all of these kinds of things and if you say well you know what it is i'm it's it's saturday afternoon um, I'm going to get a flask of tea, I'm going to get some sandwiches, and I'm going to sit with a fishing rod on the side of a riverbank or a, or a beach, like literally all day, um, or as long as I've got the tide, and there's, I'm not going to produce anything, I'm not going to be buying anything, I'm not going to be part of, 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 of this grid for, for that little amount of time, and, and it, it's, it's a wonderful thing, I think... Um, I always advise people to do. I, I don't go and yell enough. Yeah, I completely sympathise with that. Every Saturday for the last like six months, I've taken myself to um, well either the pub or, or I'll get a sort of bottle of wine and I'll go and sit by the river where I live and and just sort of write poetry and drink some wine and and that's it. You know, com completely unproductive. I was going to say I, I really like your sort of um, countryside rambles. I I particularly it's one of the first ones I watched. I particularly enjoyed the one about uh, that. Sort of wee woman with the cano corso who tried to kill your dog. Oh yeah, um, yeah. That, that that hit a chord with me because I've got a greyhound, ex racing greyhound. He's absolutely massive, and he's he's really friendly. He won't go after other dogs, but he does need to wear a muzzle because if a small dog comes up to him or gets in his face, he will kill it. And uh, yeah, it just it kind of reminded me of that because so many people nowadays, especially after the lockdown with lockdown dogs, they get these dogs, particularly if they're big ones. And uh, they have no idea how to control them. But no, that that was that was really enjoyable. That one, and you should keep on doing them because they are they're fantastic. Um, yeah, there's so much content goes on Substack these days that um, yeah, I probably will. The, that that's what I'll probably be going forward with on the YouTube channel because the YouTube channel it irritates me because it tends to gather a bit of dust these days, and I need to I need to step up a bit on that front. But there's yeah. you know there's only there's only so much a man can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask just by way of closing, Morgoth, if I may, um, you know, you, you write a lot in Substack now. And um, as someone who previously was, was earning their their living writing, um, you know, was in that PR agency um, and still loves to write every day, I, I'm interested in um, how people write and what their models are, if they have any methods. Like, do you you know, do you write on on the computer? Do you use a, a pen? Do you do you have to go anywhere in particular? Do you write at a particular time in the morning? I know this probably sounds completely irrelevant, but it's I've always been interested in this, and I was just wondering uh, if if you could say a couple of words about about that. My I, where I used to write is the uh, dashboard of the old blog, um, and then and then afterwards because I I feel like it's it's more of a separate private space. Mm. Um, I've got a couple of private blogs that I use to 
stash notes and do things. And I tend to um, write in, I'll, I'll do the same for videos. I mean, my, my, my video essays, because I began writing and not doing videos, uh, and people, uh, that might surprise people, all I've done is kind of gone back to what I was doing in the first place. And even the videos that I did, except for the more off-the-cuff ones, were written essays, um, both me talking. So then the the essay, the way I generally approach it is that I'll I'll have a, a concept, I'll have something that I want to explore, and then I'll tend to begin by listing off a load of bullet points, which is things that I want to express and things that are directions that I want to take in. And another um, trick that I tend to do when I'm writing is that I'll have two or three different themes almost like motifs which will sort of come back and they'll intertwine and play off each other throughout the essay even though my essays tend to be on the short side my my latest one on the 90s one day in the 90s is, is like mm. 2200 words which is on the long side for me um but but generally it'll be sort of 1000 to 1500 words but what i try to do is to have two or three different themes which intersect so an example would be um the one i did about chernobyl it was the chernobyl um disaster but then also with sort of through the lens of bertrand de juveniles on power like how would he how how does that if you look at the soviet state through the uh, juvenilean lens and then you will apply it to Chernobyl. So there's like three different things happening at the same time in the post. A lot of the times I'll um, I'll bring in like a, a movie, um, and I'll be, I'll contrast to something that happened in a movie or a bit of pop culture, and then weave it into some kind of narrative like that. And I'll write down a lot of uh, notes. I tend to be quite a compact writer. I try to squeeze. I try to. Um, that's why my essays tend to be short, is because I try and get as much in there as I can. My when I first began writing at the the first blog, my motto was that I want to give as much chocolate fudge with the vanilla as possible. Mm. So, so so you you keep as much uh, of interest uh, as possible there and keep the vanilla quota down as much as possible that was my general rule of thumb going in and i find that if you uh, find interesting concepts to hook things on um to to illuminate something uh is, is a good way to do it so the, let's say the offcom one for example that i did recently um w would be the the, the baseball bat gangster image was woven in with the the sort of the the power of the British state shutting down Mark Stein. Um, another one that I did was um, when I all I did was walk the dog at night, and it was just this where I keep kept seeing these gigantic televisions on people's walls. Oh yeah, I see those all the time as well. Where yeah. I live, I call it televisions the size of walls. So in there, it was sort of like a, a essay version of one of me, you know, whip the phone out hot takes, but. Um, it was kind of like I'm walking the dog uh, in winter when it's normally I'd be in the fields and it's dark and then it's just seeing these like nobody seems to care about privacy anymore. So there's a sort of little juxtaposition of just walking a dog and observing things along the way, and then zero got like really getting in on the just the sheer size of the televisions. I mean, and it, it's one of those things where. Um, they used to call like New Order, the early stuff, like boredom with a beat. And what you're doing is kind of artistically zeroing in and focusing on something. And, I mean, if you take the televisions the size of walls, these giant televisions, like what are they like when they're turned off? So is that just like a giant black monolith hanging on the wall? Like, well, the answer to that is that they just never get turned off. They'll turn the sound down, but it means people live in the living rooms with these moving images constantly on all of the time. This this like relentless intrusion of of the media into their personal space, you know. Um, 
so so yeah, I try and have a few different themes within an essay that can uh, sort of as motifs which come and go throughout it. Thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's actually quite helpful as well because sometimes I get an idea and I think, oh, I'll 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 bash that out because that's an interesting idea, but it, it might be helpful to sort of hold off a bit and see if that can be sort of woven in with a, with a few other things. Just just on the TV thing, very quickly, it, it, it's two way now, isn't it? Because it's not just the media intruding into your own room. It's you know with smart televisions and going back to the you know your old smart fridges you're sort of giving them information away now whether it's your your face or your you know personal information or your preferences um and i, I knew kids growing up who well I, I had friends growing up who had siblings who would literally never not be watching television they'd have one in their own room as toddlers and it literally all they do they stand in their crib and they just look and just gaze into this endless display of you know, cartoons and and crap, and obviously every single one of these cartoons is giving them a, a liberal prejudice with which to grow up. It's hugely depressing. Yeah, I do. I do see the. I mean, you know, just to end on a on a bit of a a, a bit of a lighter note, uh, a happier note. I, I do see this this people becoming wary of this. People becoming sort of burned out with with all of these gizmos and gadgets uh and the, the, there's you find ever more insidious ways that they that you have to sign up to subscriptions and whatnot which is, which is really going to irritate a lot of people um so i think i think i do foresee uh another another which is related to ai and, and another article that i did which another one which was like on that one, I, I kind of contrasted it with um, Total Recall and AI. And it wasn't that I think AI is going to turn into a supercomputer that will rule the world. But that what, what's going to happen is that uh, you, you're, uh, you will remember, we will remember it for you wholesale. But I said, um, we, we, we will deep fake it for you wholesale. And because what, what's going to happen with the internet, I think, is that you're going to get everything is going to be faked. And you're you're not going to know um, if what you're the story that you're seeing, or the person that you're listening to, or the the photo that you think is real. Nobody's going to know if it's real or fake. And there's only so much time that people can spend trying to wade through it all. And I think this, along with just the the general intrusion of all of the technology is going to lead not so much to some kind of giant backlash, but a, 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 a more of a kind of boredom um, and burnout with it all, which I think is going to be a good thing. I, I think that's I think that's going to be a healthy development. Yeah, the, the precursor, hopefully, to the, the Butlerian Jihad. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through it. And then <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's been it's been a it's been a slog this one because I've I've been busy. There's been a lot going on, um, but it's been a slog. But I'm 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 getting there. I will say it's great, uh, and I'm going to do a podcast and maybe all like which will also probably become a video on YouTube of a, a, a general review of it because it it has been thoroughly enjoyable. The the Dune, you mean? Or well, yeah, the Butlerian Jihad is is the sort of prequel to Dune by thousands of years the only problem is there's actually it's actually a trilogy of books and I oh you just, said yeah yeah I, like, I have yet to read any of them so yeah yeah so humanity is in well, i mean it's we're kind of we talk about circular history like how's this for wrapping up the, the humanity is um enslaved by machines and tr transhumanists um, the transhumanists were themselves enslaved by a supercomputer, and humanity are just treat like garbage. They're just um, they're just constantly experimented on and and uh, in horrible different ways, and they find a way to push back. But um, I'll save all of that for me me review. I very much look forward to it. Um, yeah, no, very good way of wrapping up. Uh, come full circle. Um, well, can I say, Morgoth, at the risk of sounding sycophantic, um, it's been a genuine pleasure to talk with. Uh, I won't say hero because that would be, that would be very sycophantic, but uh, it's been a genuine pleasure talking with with someone who's who's been very formative in my own 
uh, thinking and, and the sort of the circles I, I move in now. Um, and I, I thank you very much for your time. And uh, did you have any announcements or anything you want to say before we, we close up? Um, no, not really. Um, it's been enjoyable to have a chat. And um, well, thanks a lot, folks. Excellent. Well, I hope to talk to you again one day. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you have a nice evening. I hope the weather's uh, nice up there. That's pretty miserable, actually. But uh, <laughs> I'm used to it. April showers, yeah. Well, thank you, Morgoth. Have a lovely evening. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up then. Have a good All one. All right. See you. Thank you.